Okay, so a couple weeks ago, Josh and I were talking about his next sermon, which was scheduled for today, is scheduled for today, and he has what we call an open Sunday, where the speaker can talk about whatever he wants to, and we were kicking around some ideas about what to do. Mindful that our series on the Old Testament would be starting up here again pretty soon, I suggested that he look at one of the Psalms. Um, it's been a while since anyone has done that sort of thing, and plus working through one of the prayers or songs of ancient Israel might kind of, you know, help set the tone for that series. And eventually we entertained the idea of doing an overview of what is called the Song of Ascents, a group of 15 psalms that run from 120 to 134. How many are vaguely familiar with that? Okay, a, a few. And uh, this would be, of course, something different and would probably be something that most of our folks would not be all that familiar with. And yet at the same time, this group of psalms seems to have been pretty significant among the ancient Israelites, um, <clears throat> at least later on in their history. And so it seemed to be something that would, um, you know, this, this would be a valuable thing to address. And Josh was excited to jump into it. The only snag was that he was heading out to Colorado right away to spend time with family there, and um, preparing for sermons can be a bit time-consuming, and so I suggested that we split the message into two parts, and uh, so that's the plan for this morning, something a little bit different. He will talk about these 15 psalms as a whole, get into the what they were used for and how they came about, and um, some of the theories about all of that. And then I will follow up and do a quick summary on each one and finish the morning with um, some comments on application. And hopefully you'll find this rather interesting, and more importantly, hopefully you will find it beneficial. So, Josh, I'll turn over to you at this point. Thanks, Wendell. So, yeah, this was a very, very much welcomed uh, suggestion by... Wendell to approach the sermon in this way. For those of you who don't know, uh, Maddie and I's trip to Colorado was uh, sort of conceived last minute um, as the my cousin who is staying with my grandparents uh, and helping them in their older age uh, had to leave on a business trip. And so she and I communicated and uh, figured it would be a good time for us to try and get out there, uh, spend time with them, help them around the house, and just be present. Yeah. So for that reason, we took off rather last minute and experienced this sort of clash in schedule with the sermon. So again, very, very thankful to Wendell for walking through this with me and to all of you for your grace this morning. So that said, we're going to be looking at a very small uh, but poignant section of the Psalms this morning, as Wendell already mentioned, specifically Psalm, uh, Psalm 120 through 134. If you want to go ahead and make your <clears throat> make your way to those psalms, you may find it beneficial. So these are 15 short psalms that make up just a small fraction of the greater Psalter, the greater book of psalms. But there's a lot in these psalms that we're all probably very familiar with. Um, for example, there's Psalm 121. I bet you've heard these words before. I lift my eyes up to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. It's also Psalm 124. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Or the assurances of Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. There's the wisdom of Psalm 127. We've heard this before. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And of course, there's the precursor to the gospel. <clears throat> Psalm 130. If you, O Lord, should mark our iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, 
and in his word, I hope. And finally, there's Psalm 133, one of the charter passages of the ministry we partner with in Israel, Shevet Achim, and a passage relevant to any Christian community like our own. Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. These are just a few samples uh, of the richness of this group of psalms known as the Songs of Ascents. Now, Wendell will be working us through them, um, digging through them just in just a little bit. But So for now, I really want to explore with you how these psalms came to be in this collection and what they might have been used for. And I'll start, I'll start by saying that well, it is a possibility for some of them. I do not think that these psalms were originally written to be a part of the songs of ascents. Instead, I think these 15 psalms appear to have been written by different authors at different times and with different purposes, for different purposes. Between the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and what's known as the Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew and Aramaic text of the Tanakh, or the Hebrew Bible, um, we're actually given some clues as to the original authors of these psalms. So, for example, King David is identified as having written four of these, 122, 124, 131, and 133. His son, King Solomon, wrote just one, and in the remaining ten, the authorship is not defined for us. We do not actually know who the authors are. But what is believed is that a later editor or editors came along. They gathered up these psalms based on their content, based on some structure of the psalm. They collected them and they put them together uh, to make up a unique little book of its own within the greater book of the Psalms, a mini Psalter within a Psalter, if you will. And this editor or these editors gave this collection a new purpose. And I think we find that purpose described in the title or the superscription of each Psalm that would have been added to the Psalm later by the editors. So if you turn to Psalm 120, you'll see what I'm talking about. Most of our English translations in this room will have a heading that reads in its simplest English form, a song of ascents. Now, there are some English translations, like the New Living Translation, for example, where you might see a different title, a different superscription. And so I'll say right now, the way the NLT translates that title sort of gives away the direction that we're going with this sermon. So if you are out there and you're using an NLT or another translation where you see something different from a song of a sense, don't spoil it for your neighbor just yet. Keep it to yourself. All right. So the title for these psalms that most translations use, A Song of a Sense, comes from the Hebrew, Shir Hama'alot, Shir Hama'alot. And that first word, shir, is simply translated hymn or song. There's not much ambiguity to it. And so that can tell us that whatever the songs of ascents were for, they were specifically songs. They were meant to be sung. And then if we look at the structure of these psalms as well, they're generally shorter than the other psalms, averaging about six and a half verses per song. And this probably means that they were... They were kind of gathered and, and set up to, to be memorized and converted into these short, catchy tunes uh, that could be sung just from memory. The second word, though, is where things become just a little bit less clear. In the singular form, ma'ala, or in this case, plural, ma'alot, there's a variety of meanings and uses. But... The more you dig into it, the more you see well, it stays pretty consistent with this root idea of climbing, climbing heights, progressing, sort of a step by step by step, an idea of ascending somewhere. In the case of Malot on the screen behind me, it's a plural for goings up. Okay? And so we put together those words, sheer. And we get a song of ascents, a song of goings up. 
And so it begs the question, like, what is being referred to with the use of this word behind me? What exactly are the ascents, the goings up? And if we can discern what that word means in this context, we can develop a generally good idea of what the Song of Ascents were for. And there are really, I think, four primary views on what ma'alot refers to. So some argue that the, these ascents are just a literary feature that they are a, a sort of a progressing steps or gradations within the psalm itself that allows for it to be sung in a certain way. The second view is that the ascents had something to do with the Israelites' release from Babylonian exile, that it was a going up out of exile in Babylon to the heights of Jerusalem. The third view is that the ascents were referring to actual steps, this time in the temple, that the ascents involved some sort of temple ritual for the priests climbing, just, uh, climbing certain steps and singing along the way, and we'll talk about that more in just a little bit. And the fourth view is that the ascents refer to uh, travel pilgrims would undergo, making their way up the mountain to Jerusalem for certain feasts and holidays. And the songs, therefore, would be songs that they sang during their pilgrimage. So let's just look through these uh, briefly. First, the idea that the ascents are steps or gradations within the Psalms themselves. So this theory comes from an observation that some of the Psalms carry certain patterns in how they're structured. So an idea will be introduced in one verse and then picked up and developed upon, expounded on in the next verse and so on and so forth, creating sort of a step-like, constantly uh, upward moving and developing progression through the verses up until some sort of climactic point. So an example of this you can find in Psalm 121, if you have your Bibles open with you. In verse 1, you can see the concept of help picked up and developed in verse 2. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Same thing in verse 3. We see the concept of keeping or watching over, depending on your translation, developed and expounded on in verses 4 and 5, and so on. Now, there are some very in-depth arguments for this particular view, but the general problem, the overall problem here, is that this sort of step, this gradation structure, is not actually seen in all of the Psalms of Ascents, okay? And it is seen in some Psalms that are not in this grouping of 15 Psalms. So it makes the theory or the view feel just a little bit inconsistent. Now, it's always possible that the structure of the Psalms had something to do with the title, but I'm, I'd say there are uh, other more likely views. Which brings us to the second one, that the Ascents are referring to a going up from Babylon to Israel at the end of their exile. Now, those who favor this view will point to passages like Ezra 7.7 7 or Ezra 7.9 that both use language consistent with the rest of Scripture to refer to individuals going up to Jerusalem from Babylon. So you can see, for example, Ezra 7.9 on the screen behind me. For on the first day of the first month, he began to go up from Babylonia, and on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem, for the good hand of his God was on him. So that line, he began to go up, contains the same wordage, ma'allah, we see in the titles of the 15 Psalms. And I'll discuss this more in detail in just a minute, but the idea of going up to Jerusalem is a reasonable way to talk about traveling from the lowlands of Babylon to the mountain heights of Jerusalem. It doesn't matter if you're actually traveling west or southwest, you're still ascending, you're still going up to reach Jerusalem. So it's not really, and I'll explain that more in just a little bit, but it's not really a stretch to think, okay, the songs of ascents could have been sung by exiles like Ezra on that same kind of journey. And what makes this view even more compelling is that Psalm 126 Part of the Songs of Ascents is believed to actually directly refer to this return from exile. As Wendell will point out in just a little bit, it speaks of a longing for God's <clears throat> favor to fall on Jerusalem and to fall on her people again. 
Now, there is one little problem with this view, namely uh, that the word for going up in the psalm titles, as I've already stressed, is plural. It's a song of ascents, ma'alot, not ascent, ma'ala. It's a song of goings up, not going up. And so it seems like a small distinction, but it's significant here. So the songs of ascents, from what we can tell, were not meant to be a one-time deal, right? Uh, they were something that it seems the editors intended to be sung over and over again. Something, something was to be ascended time and time again, and those songs were to be sung during that repeated ascension. And so that doesn't really seem to fit with this idea of a one-time return from exile. Which brings us to our last two options. Number three, that the songs um, of ascent are about literal steps. And here's, we're gonna get a little, little crazy here, so stay with me. This time, it's not steps in the Psalms literary structure, but actual steps in the temple. And this view rests heavily on Jewish Talmudic tradition. According to the Mishnah, or the Judaic oral law and tradition found in the Babylonian Talmud, there was in the temple a semicircular flight of stairs. You can see them kind of pointed out behind me on the screen. And this semicircular flight of stairs had 15 steps, which led from the court of the men in the temple courtyards down to the court of the women. And so, again, extra biblical Jewish oral tradition says that the Levites, the priests, they would play musical instruments and they would sing these 15 psalms of ascents as they ascended those 15 steps. Here's what the Mishnah says directly. Levites with harps, lyres, cymbals, and trumpets, and countless other musical instruments were there upon the 15 steps, leading down from the Azara to the court of the women, corresponding to the 15 songs of ascent. They stood upon these steps with their instruments of music and sang their songs. Well, there you have it. It seems pretty clearly stated there. The issue is, um, there's not much evidence outside of the Mishnah that this actually happened. The only thing this tradition actually has going for it is the likely coincidental correlation between 15 songs and 15 steps. And if you think I'm being unreasonable with, with that criticism, let's keep reading the same Jewish tradition. Um, so. As you continue reading, they, they believe that David, King David, wrote all the songs of ascents. Okay, we can, I've already said it seems to be otherwise, but we can, let's play, with, let's roll with that for a minute. So King David wrote all the songs of ascents, and he wrote them as he was digging the foundations of the mikdash, or the place of God's holy dwelling place, or dwelling presence. Now, Forgive me, I doubt any of you came here today expecting to do a deep dive into Jewish oral tradition, but here we go. So this should help us better appreciate what's going on here. I'm going to read a brief excerpt from it. And again, this is a continuation of what's on the screen behind me. So Rav Chista asked a certain rabbi why King David composed these 15 songs of ascents to begin with. The rabbi replied that when King David had begun the excavations for the place of the temple's altar, the waters of the subterranean deep rushed upwards and threatened to engulf the planet. David thereupon composed 15 songs of ascents and the depths safely subsided. If so, Rav Chista immediately protested, why not call them the songs of descents to reflect on the subsiding waters instead of songs of ascents? You have reminded me, replied the anonymous rabbi, that this is what occurred. When the deep surged upwards, King David thought to inscribe the name of God on a piece of earthenware and cast it into the waters. His teacher, Achitophel, ruled that it would be permissible to do so based on the following reasoning. If, for the sake of harmony between a husband and his wife, whom he suspects of infidelity, God commands us to erase his name by placing the parchment into a container of water and giving it to the woman to drink, then it is certainly permissible for King David to cast the divine name into the surging waters to bring peace to the entire world. 
King David immediately cast the name into the waters, which then subsided not 15, but 16 levels. King David realized that the earth's irrigational needs would henceforth be lacking and therefore voiced 15 songs of ascents that brought the waters back up to a safe and useful level. In his commentary on the Talmud, Maharsha adds that the particular divine name that King David wrote was yud He, which bears the numerical value of 15. The temple steps and a song of ascents likewise correspond to this name of God. Anything unusual about this story to you? Pretty weird stuff, okay? Few peculiar things going on. It's very mystical, it's extra biblical, of course, and it's built around this rabbinical Jewish tradition. And the more you learn about rabbinical Jewish oral tradition especially, the more you realize they have a tendency of looking for arguably coincidental correlating numbers. They look for number patterns and they start to apply all kinds of things to it. And that, that seems to be what's happening here, rendering this view increasingly unlikely in my opinion. Now, I suppose it's always possible that the Levites did sing certain songs as they climbed the temple steps, and yes, there were 15 steps. And it, and it, and it does also fit the repetitive need for the songs of a sense. But I don't think I need to say there's a lot of additional details in this view that are hard to confirm or that evenly, even seem to contradict the available evidence. So all that to say, we have one more view that I do find the most compelling. And that's that the term ascent actually describes the physical climb or walk to a summit. That the Song of Ascents were songs meant to be sung by pilgrims on their way up to Jerusalem during major annual festivals like the Passover or Shavuot, which is the Pentecost, and the Day of Atonement. And there's a lot of good support for this view. So first of all, there's the needed repetition. Three times a year, at least, pilgrims would have been making this climb to Jerusalem and they would have been singing these songs. There's the needed geography. Jerusalem is located on what's called Mount Moriah, which is one of the highest points in the region of Israel. Now, I was just in Colorado, and they have a Mount Snuffles there. Anybody seen or heard of Mount Snuffles? Not enough of you. Okay. This is a respectable mountain. It's over 14,000 feet. So I need to be clear on what I'm saying when I say Mount Moriah. Compared to other mountains, uh, really Mount Moriah is a bit more of a hill. Okay. It's only about 760 meters. That's roughly uh, 21 to 2,500 feet. Um, but it's a place of elevation. Here we have a, a real-time picture of what's believed to be Mount Moriah. It's a place of elevation uh, surrounded by valleys. And so anytime you want to reach the top, if you see that golden dome there, that is where, um, that's basically sitting on the courtyard of, of Solomon's temple. And so you see, uh, if you want to get to that temple, if you want to enter Jerusalem, well, you have to ascend from the valleys below that surround Mount Moriah. It's also a place of elevation in terms of significance. So this location is believed to be what Abraham first called the mountain of the Lord in Genesis 22 when he was spared from sacrificing his son. This is the mountain that became a central place of rule and worship for the Hebrew people under King David. This is the mountain where King Solomon built the temple as the symbolic dwelling place of God and we're told that his presence was even manifest there as he dwelt among his people. So the mountain of Jerusalem was not, is not just referred to as a physically high place, but also, one could argue, a symbolically elevated place. And so I think the language Scripture uses to speak of Jerusalem, all throughout Scripture, certainly reflects that. And I challenge you to go do a word study and, and read through and see how Jerusalem is referenced for yourselves. But the Bible often speaks of people going up to Jerusalem and coming down from Jerusalem regardless of whether they're going north or south or east or west. It's always going up or coming down. It's always an ascent if you are going up to the mountain of the Lord, and it's a descent if you're leaving it. And as you read that, the Bible going forward, 
look for that ascending, descending language. Jesus himself actually used it. I found this just recently in Mark 10, 33, telling his disciples, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. So we have the repetition we need. This is being done every year for these holy days. We have the geography and the significance needed for ascents to Jerusalem, and we have the Psalms themselves. So the songs of ascents reflect in some way what could have been the experiences of the pilgrims making the journey to the mountain of the Lord. Consider Psalm 122, verse 1. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Or Psalm 122, verse 2. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. Or Psalm 132, verse 7. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. So when you put all the pieces together, this seems to be the most compelling purpose, I think, for the songs of ascents. They were songs of worship and encouragement for the pilgrim to sing as they made their way to the temple, to Jerusalem, to worship. And if this is actually the purpose for these psalms, I think it's pretty neat to, to think that there's a great chance that Joseph and Mary would have sung these very words, these very psalms with young Jesus in Luke 2.41 as they made their way, their annual trip, Luke tells us, in Luke 2.41 to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. Also interesting to think that Jesus and his Jewish disciples, as they were traveling up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover together before his death and resurrection, they may have been singing these songs together as well. These are all very good possibilities. And what I think we'll find also true, as Wendell leads us now through a brief study of these, the content of these psalms, is that these songs are, are certainly appropriate. They're appropriate to sing for those who are on their way to God's city, but have not reached it yet. Wendell. All right, thanks, Josh. You find that interesting? Probably material that you have not been all that familiar with. So like Josh said, we'd like to now kind of work through each of these one by one. Obviously, all we're going to do this morning is a quick survey. So if you already don't have your Bibles open, you might want to at this time. And I just encourage you to uh, maybe read through them this week and it might take two or three a day and kind of do that. They're, they are, um, and, and um, hopefully you'll find them helpful. So we'll start with the first one here. Um, Psalm 120, this one is considered a, a psalm of lament, if you will remember how we used that expression when we did our study on the psalms a number of years ago. This is, in particular, this one here is sung by someone living far away from Israel, longing for his homeland. In particular, his distress concerns the way that liars and troublemakers are trying to stir up war and unrest. Uh, verse 5 is significant. Woe to me that I dwell in Meshech, that I live among the tents of Kedar. Meshech was a people living quite a ways north of Israel, be like modern-day Turkey, and Kedar was a people dwelling in the Arabian desert quite a ways south of Israel. And obviously the psalmist can't be at both places at the same time, and so what we have here is basically a you know, he is poetically referring to two faraway places in opposite directions to refer to the sense of alienation from Jerusalem. Um, absent from his homeland and surrounded by slanders and liars and those consumed with violence, he is one who loves truth and peace, becomes acutely aware of how much of a misfit he is among them, and he longs to be home with those who cherish peace. And this psalm then uh, the first one here, which highlights one's homesickness for Jerusalem, is a fitting way to begin one's pilgrimage to it. Psalm 121. Uh, yeah, uh, missed. What's happened here? I'm off. Psalm 121. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm I'm okay. I'm confused up here. Just call me Joe Biden, okay? Just. <laughs> <laughs> sorry for any Democrats I may have offended there. All right. Psalm 121 is a popular psalm. As you skim over it, it should look familiar to you. As the Israelites made their journey to Jerusalem, this psalm would remind them that the Lord was with them every step of the way. Regardless of the dangers they faced, he would watch over them and keep them from harm. The journey itself becomes a picture or parable for the whole of one's life. 
um, in which the faithful can be confident of God's timeless care. The Lord will keep you from all harm, it reads. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your comings and goings both now and forevermore. All right, the tone changes with Psalm 122. Psalm 120 was a lament where one experiences both the alienation from his homeland and a longing to return. Psalm 121 deals with overcoming fear and finding assurance in God's protection. This Psalm 122, to follow that progression, is one of joyful anticipation. The travelers celebrate Jerusalem as God's chosen city and rejoice in the privilege of going there. And uh, the first verse there sets the stage. It's easy to imagine meeting up with fellow travelers um, along the way. I rejoiced with those. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So this is very easy to envision. Uh, Psalm 123 <clears throat> Here we uh, picture a situation in which those making the long and difficult trip to Jerusalem become objects of scorn and ridicule. Joyful expectation of heading off to Zion is now tempered with the reality of certain hardships and struggles of getting there. Whereas Psalm 121 was about seeking relief from dangers, this one, Psalm 123, is about seeking relief from tormentors and persecutors. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us, for we have endured much contempt, for we have endured much ridicule from the proud, much contempt from the arrogant. Psalm 124 is a psalm of thanksgiving, celebrating the Lord's deliverance from an enemy that could have destroyed them. It ties in the, with the previous psalm and recounts the possible outcomes had the Lord not protected his people. And the key words, of course, are there in verse 1 and repeated in verse 2, if the Lord had not been on our side. Psalm 125 <clears throat> compares the faithful to Jerusalem, that is, to Mount Zion itself. Just as other mountains surround Mount Zion, so does the Lord surround his people with his love and protection. Josh read this one earlier. Those who trust in the Lord are like, are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. So in the psalm, the worshipers record, recount the Lord's promise that um, any occupation of a foreign power over their land will be temporary. And this psalm, therefore, is meant to encourage the faithful to remain loyal to him and warns of the dangers of turning to evil, as seen in verses 4 and 5. Okay, everyone follow along so far? Okay. <clears throat> psalm 126 relates how Zion is the central place for the Lord's praise and the centerpiece of his plan. It recalls a previous time when God blessed Jerusalem and asked that such favor would be shown to it again. It is in this psalm that we find those familiar words, those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. Okay, as you look over Psalm 127, it too should seem quite familiar to you. Uh, the basic theme here is that without the Lord's blessing, including home and family, all human labor is worthless. Verse 1 is quite clear. Unless the Lord builds the house, its labors labor in vain. Its builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. The psalm reminded the travelers that all of life's securities and blessings are ultimately gifts from God and not merely the result of their own achievements. Thus, the Lord should be included in all their plans and activities. All right, Psalm 128 <clears throat> expands some of the topics found in that previous psalm there. Home and family are, again, major themes. God's blessing is crucial for the strength of his kingdom. Thus, all who want to experience this blessing must make his way to God's chosen city, Jerusalem. May the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your lives. Whereas blessings proceed from Zion in um, this psalm, in the next psalm, 129, the tone changes to that of pronouncing curses on those who hate Zion. Uh, may all who hate Zion be turned back to shame. May they be like grass on the roof, which withers before it can start to grow. So 129 reminds the travelers that the road to Jerusalem, which is the path to blessing, is plagued with obstacles and enemies. Uh, the psalm reflects on what God's people have endured and how God has sustained them. They have greatly oppressed me, but they have not gained victory over me. So again, a psalm of assurance and hope. Now for 130, 
In previous psalms, the obstacles to worshiping in Zion consist of dangers along the road, especially the enemies of God's people. Uh, this one, appropriately enough, deals with an even greater threat, and that would be their sin. And so this is a song of repentance. It is geared toward helping the travelers see themselves as a forgiven people whose only right to enter God's presence is in his mercy. If you, O Lord, had kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. Psalm 131 continues the tone from the previous psalm and serves as a confession of humble trust in the Lord. It's only three verses long. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me, but I have calmed and quieted myself. I am like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child, I am content. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. So you can see how this psalm would be very useful in one's travels to Jerusalem, especially as, he, as they are getting closer to it. All right, Psalm, well, Psalm 131 is one of the shortest in this group of 15. Psalm 132, our next one here, is the longest with 18 verses. The theme here is God's covenant with the house of David, a covenant in which God promises to establish David's dynasty for the benefit of Israel and eventually for the benefit of the whole world. The psalm strongly affirms David's place in God's redemptive plan. The Lord sworn earth. The Lord swore an oath to David, a sure oath that he will not revoke. One of your own descendants I will place on your throne, for the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling. So in this psalm, God, God's commitment to Jerusalem is quite clear, which helps to explain God's promises to it and to those who honor it. Again, as we see, um, we can see how such a psalm would help to inspire joy and eager expectation as travelers made their long and laborious journey to the holy city. To honor and appreciate Jerusalem is to honor and appreciate the one who loves Jerusalem. Now for Psalm 133, as we start to wrap up our countdown, uh, this too is a familiar psalm, one that commends the virtues of unity among God's people. Here again, we could easily envision travelers anticipating their arrival in the holy city where they will be joined by the multitudes of their fellow countrymen, all celebrating the festivals together. And such events would generate the sense of unity and camaraderie, you know, this solidarity, a large family reunion of all God's people spending time uh, at the festivals together enjoying each other. Verse 1 paints that very picture. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. The final psalm of, or the final song of ascent, Psalm 134, is geared toward a liturgical occasion, perhaps the opening of one of the festivals. Upon arrival into the city, the appropriate reaction is that of offering up genuine praise to the Lord himself. Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who is maker of heaven and earth. So one of the important and ongoing themes found in the Psalms of Ascents is that God's blessing comes from Zion, and this psalm concludes on that very note. Again, to honor and appreciate Jerusalem is to honor and appreciate the one who loves Jerusalem. Okay, so finally this morning, um, a couple thoughts regarding application. How might we apply these 15 songs of a sense? How might these ancient prayers and songs become our prayers and songs? Well, first, um, it's pretty obvious, any application on our part is going to be quite a bit different than the way the ancient Israelites applied them because we don't make pilgrimages to Jerusalem to celebrate feasts and festivals at the temple. These psalms were used to stir within them a longing for a particular city, Jerusalem, and as they sang through them during their journey, day by day, their anticipation and excitement grew. However, we have or should have a similar anticipation and excitement, not about Jerusalem, but about another city, what the author of Hebrews calls the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. And that city, of course, is described in the 21st chapter of Revelation, where it comes down out of heaven and becomes the dwelling of God among his people in the new creation. 
And uh, there are certain themes in these 15 psalms that we could adapt for our own prayers and worship that relate to our pilgrimage to this eternal holy city of God. Some of those themes could include prayers of thanksgiving for God's blessing, rejoicing that this new Jerusalem is promised to us, prayers for God's protection, as in deliver us from evil, humble contrition, repentance from sin, expressing confidence in God's watchfulness, fostering a sense of unity among fellow brothers and sisters, encouraging others to remain true to the Lord, and so on. Those sorts of themes that we found there. We could even <clears throat> borrow uh, specific verses like, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord, to help kind of inspire the sense of mutual expectation where we will together with the Lord spend eternity in this new Jerusalem. And as we long and <clears throat> as we long and in for and anticipate our own arrival at God's eternal kingdom, there are again a number of things that we could be reflecting on, should be reflecting on, on a regular basis. And some of those again can be found in these 15 Psalms. <clears throat> if nothing else, we should aspire to imitate the ancient Hebrews and their hunger for the Lord, as demonstrated by their intentional trips to Jerusalem. The second thing regarding application is that we probably don't want to force things here too much. Um, there have been devotional books written on these 15 Psalms where a writer will go out of his or her way to make every verse personally relevant to the individual reader as though the psalm was written specifically with him or her in mind with no regard to the original setting. And, and this is where this meme comes to mind and it's probably one that you've seen before. <clears throat> to pick up on a popular song. Um, so technically, technically, on one level here, the Psalms are not really about us. They are about the ones who composed them, about ancient Israel, about God, and so on. That said, they can become our prayers and songs of praise as well. Some of them may be difficult to relate to, but a lot of them are relatable. And, if, and it is certainly allowable, if not beneficial, to borrow from them accordingly. In fact, those who used these psalms in their pilgrimage to Jerusalem were themselves borrowing them for a purpose that was different than what they were originally intended for, at least some of the, within this group of 15. So when all is said, these songs of ascent are valuable to us if for no other reason uh, than to provide us some insight into the experiences of the ancient Israelites which is always something that we should strive to, to have. But at the same time, I, I would still argue that as, as we long for the new Jerusalem, and the New Testament is very clear about our eager expectation that we should have for this, there is much here that in these psalms that can serve as a template of our own calling out to God. The first one, for instance, talks about how one feels like a misfit in the culture that he finds himself in and longs to be in the holy city, to be among those who love righteousness and peace. And the last one celebrates the arrival with praise and worship. And the ones in between provide themes that can be adapted as well. So hopefully to uh, conclude here, you found this interesting, hopefully beneficial on some level. And, and um, I would just uh, conclude with, this last, with the last verse of the last Psalm of Ascents. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, Bless you from Zion. So upon that, let's stand, and we're going to close with um, uh, a couple, two or three verses here from the um, song, Be Thou My Vision, which we think is, is an appropriate way to close after this uh, study.